See, I had it all sorted out. There it is, okay. Sorry about that. You wouldn't believe how many pieces of paper go into this job. Okay, and our next speaker, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, uh, David Yurth will have an extra presentation at uh, five o'clock today. So we'll be squeezing that in between um, <coughs> that. We still don't have a title. I've been trying to find him. <coughs> Running a car off of ambient energy. Okay, thank you. <coughs> okay, our next speaker comes from uh, the same state I do, uh, John Arthur Taylor. He's from uh, Casper, Wyoming, which is the other large town in our state. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, like 50,000, I mean, that's pretty large, isn't it? I found out that 50,000 people is critical mass to form your own culture. And that's, that's what Athens was at the time everything blossomed there. Um, anyway, John Arthur Taylor started his career as an aircraft mechanic. By doing that, he learned to fix just about anything. And so he uh, went into private aviation. One time he was asked to uh, make a repair <coughs> Excuse me. that he knew wouldn't work. <coughs> and so he got out of that business. And um, then he had uh, You know, he found out that with the uh, private aviation, one of the problems was they had a champagne diet on a water budget. So um, we're going to welcome here a man who has never fit any box, John Arthur Taylor. again? Can you hold on? Yeah, we actually go ahead and try that. Okay, We're testing. Yeah, there we go. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank everybody here for the chance to be here to present this lecture. And I really thank the people from Tesla Tech all the time that they've put, it, put into it because to me, this is a worthwhile cause. We have to make changes, and we have to do it very quickly. Um, and I was told that it was always nice to start out with a joke. And there's a little story behind the joke. Uh, I was working with a crew of two other guys, and we were getting right along, and then they started in on their ideal woman. I didn't see how that would fit in society, so I didn't say anything. I just kept working. And all of a sudden, that dawned on him. I hadn't said anything. So he says, well, what's your idea of the ideal woman? I said, well, hadn't thought of it much. The ideal woman needs to be very, very intelligent, non-smoker, kind, loving, gentle, and have a fine coat of fur all over her body. She can't complain she's cold. And boy, that did it. Stopped the whole job for a few minutes. <laughs> but when you're dealing with impossibilities, you have gotta stick with impossibilities. But after that, the job went really smooth because, man, we had some humor. Um, in introducing this lecture, all my life I've been rather into pursuit of wisdom and knowledge. And that's the two things to me that really hold fast to what you want to do. Um, there is nothing new under the sun because everything that we're doing here, to me, is being reinvented. A lot of stuff is being kept from us. Uh, basically, what I'm going to cover is I'm going to try to fill in some gaps of the previous speakers because they've already covered a lot of the stuff that I wanted to cover, so I'm just going to kind of skip over it a little bit. Um, but I will cover... Um, the water and the fields and stuff, the golden mean and pi, which is 3.14. But before I get into that, I'd like to give a little history. 
Uh, this is on the website too, by the way, the history. And I do have handouts here that I will hand out to people for my references. Um, the um, concept of Atlantis is not new. It was old as Plato. And when you go into the Association of Research Enlightenment out of Virginia Beach, they pretty much figured out where Atlantis is. And it was a viable civilization. But the problem is they were so highly evolved that everything that they did to us today would be like magic. And to me, there's no such thing as magic. There's an explanation. And when you get into the Egyptian technology, um, they arrived on scene in Egypt completely loaded with highly technical information. And be, from the time that they entered there, it was in decline. And at the latter part of the decline, when the Israelis made the ark, they had lost everything because what they did was they put all their information into certain brotherhood and it was just limited as to who could enter that brotherhood and pick up the information. And that's what destroyed the rest of their technology. And at, at this time, if you go into Zechariah Sitchin's work, the, you'll find the mention of the Anunnaki. And as, to me, having read a lot of history, there is a correlation there. Um, and if it is correct, the way it's stated, we were, man, per se, was built 450,000 years ago and they couldn't get enough working slaves, so they decided to build woman 225,000 years ago. The, no, I, this is what is being stated. Um, but the Anunnaki were extremely violent in their own right. And if we're built in their image, I can see where some of it comes from. Um, I'm going to skip on that for the moment. But before I do, if you look at the Dead Sea over there off Israel, you're going to see it looks like a kidney. Further examination that's coming to light is that that lower part of that kidney was formed about 2,400, 20, or 2,000 years ago by an atomic weapon. And the other one was exploded in the Sinai. What was, that was to do was to close the Anunnaki spaceport and not let it get into the hands of humans. And that's the reason that a lot of our people are coming back with radiation sickness is because nuclear radiation doesn't go away in 2,000 years. The Earth does a good job of cleaning it up, but it's not all gone. Um, and looking at that big black eye from space pictures from NASA, uh, if you look at the Sinai Peninsula, you will see that big black eye. And all the rocks in that area radiate out. And there's, sh there's light behind them and shadows before them, which means high heat. I'm going to go into the Ark of the Covenant now. And this is not a good picture of it. I tried to get a good one on the internet, but I couldn't find one that was correct. This isn't correct because of the wing structure. But this um, Ark of the Covenant, you can find it in any Bible under Exodus 25, 10-22. Now the detail is a lot of gold. And I sat down with Mr. Lindemann and we kind of figured out it must weigh around 3,000 pounds because that's no lightweight. And just the shape, next one please. Just the shape of that structure tells a lot. If you look real close, I tried to color these in to make more sense. If you look at this here, you've got your chitam wood or acacia or whatever you want to call it. And inside, um, what you have is gold on the inside, gold on the outside. And what this does is it sets up a frequency and a field. Okay, this field is being collected and collected and collected. And it also collects it from the sun, it collects it from the Earth's action, collects it from movement of the air. I mean, it just collects electricity. It's not a capacitor, it's a collector. 
And if you happened to be in the way when it was grounded, oh man, you just ruined your whole day. Uh, it's about a million volts, two million, somewhere in there. And the thing that I learned from studying different sources that I could find on the Ark of the Covenant was that if you were not in resonance with it, it would destroy you or make you sick or whatever, the stuff that was bad for you. And if it not, if you were in resonance, then you could do pretty much what you wanted to with it, plus it could be used for a weapon, but that was not what it had in mind. When I looked at this particular design, um, my first encounter with it was 10 years old, and uh, I stopped and I thought, and the instructor said, well, this is, we're gonna talk about the Ark of the Covenant. My mind went blank and I was just off and I knew exactly who, what, why, when, where, and how the, or the ark. I got, all of a sudden I got a shake on the shoulder. They said, you're not listening. No, I says, I already know what the ark is and why. And then I started laying it out and boy, they asked me not to come back. <laughs> but anyway, that's been the story of my life with churches. <laughs> uh, but uh, the properties, if you look at it, Mr. Davidson and his shape is quite correct. And when I measured the sides and divided it by the length, came out to 1.6, which is the golden mean. But there is one problem with tr trying to make an arc. We don't know what, next one please. We don't know exactly what cubit there was to use because there's so many of them. And it changes, what, from 17 inches clean up to 24? That, that's quite a span. However, when you get the right frequency, you will have a transceiver on that arc. It will be a transceiver because it will send and receive, and it can also pick up everything around it. Because uh, looking at the human body, which is quite a field of study, we have within us the means to talk with other people without voice communication. I'm thoroughly convinced of it. Um, we have a lot of abilities that aren't explored and aren't being used and they're trying to be curtailed at every step and at every means. Next one, please. Okay, when we get into shape, I'm going to kind of do a little bit of shape stuff here before I get into the gold property. What we've got with Mr. Tesla, when he did his Wardenclyffe experiments, he wanted to make a sphere. But when he found out what the cost was, the, the sphere went by the wayside for the toroid. And when he did that, he had a perfect collector in the circular entity, but with the toroid, if he re revitalized his circuit and tuned it, he could use the toroid just as effectively and far cheaper. And that's why he went that way. Next one, please. Okay, this is a, a drawing of the pyramid. And what we have here, it's just like the pyramid in Giza. You have certain um, designs, shapes, but it's all built around pi 3.14. And if you take 5% off the base, you got the sides. And that's what sets up your healing frequencies. And this is a healer. And I've healed people with green cotton cloth. It's getting harder to find that straight cotton cloth, by the way, they're doing away with it. And I used a four foot dowel. But the other thing that I forgot to draw on here is you have a power that goes up the sides and on all four sides and one side has to be facing due north while the others face the other points of the compass. And what happens is it draws energy and cycles it up and funnels it into a vortex where it combines with the uh, fields coming up from the sides and it nullifies all other um, detrimental fields and existences around it. So that's what causes it to heal because it's in tune with the natural flow of the body. Next one, please. 
Okay, on the reverse side of this, I tried to freehand some vases and jars, the Baghdad jars and stuff like this. What we're dealing with here again is shape. And why these things save energy, I mean uh, preserve stuff is, is their shape. The shape actually, oh and it's made out of clay, a certain kind of a clay too, the, the, the uh, construction does matter. It's a certain type of earth clay that when it collects the fields inside and the frequency it sets up actually preserves the goods within it. Now, you, can you just turn that one over, please? Just turn it over. Okay, well, well, that skipped one, but that's all right. We'll get into this now. I'll just cover that other one. The Baghdad battery type vase was made with that particular stuff. No, no, go back to the other one, please. There you go. Um, the, the Baghdad battery base was one that was amplified because of its shape and that's how it worked. And they, these people had an advanced technology up until about the time the Israelis went off and made the ark. Um, okay, now since I've been dealing with electricity, I know this is not going to go over good with some people, but your left hand rule, if you apply the left hand rule, to this particular setup. What you see on an oscilloscope is a sine wave. My contention is that it's a vortex going around that wire allowing just a certain amount of the aether to travel. And when it goes back the other way, it changes the vortex and it travels along the surface of the wire. The, the concept of the field is correct, but it's always circling, closing out the other influence. And the copper itself is transferring the ether out so that it goes within that vortex. And we'll get into that some more here in just a minute. Next one, please. Okay, when I went to Mr. Bahari, I told him what I was gonna do and I, he put up a whole bunch of pictures now, the, the major point that I want to make is you have to have a frequency and you have to have a field to have the frequency. They're, they're hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. Now, this here is as close as I can come to showing what a field is. Now, I don't know what this picture is, but if you look real close, you'll see a center with the dots. Let's see. Right there, see all the dots? Okay, the field expands outward, while your field is what helps to promote whatever it is you're doing. No matter what you're dealing with, you have a frequency and a field. But when you mix these frequency and fields is where you run into problems. If you don't understand what's going on, you've lost the ball game. And a good point is right here. Okay, what do you see? You see water being held by this plastic cup, right? How many of you think the plastic's holding that in there? Okay, a couple. What's going on here is you have oxygen and hydrogen. It's not exactly a solid element. You have this, almost the same elements in here except for the carbon added, okay, the plastic. What's going on here is you have two different fields. The field of the plastic is reacting against the field of the water to hold it in there. Because if you put this plastic underneath the microscope, you're gonna see it's very porous. It's completely porous. And you, you'll think to yourself, well, how does that hold water? Well, you have two different fields. And that's what causes the water to stay in the cup. So, see there again, you're dealing with a field. Um, next one, please. And here's another one that shows some more. And I'm fairly certain that these are fields, but I can't prove it because I don't have access to the slides or, or the negatives or the plates. 
But you can look and you can see a center. Oh, by the way, before I continue any further here, I have tried to find a picture of an atom that anywhere, and there are no pictures of atoms at all. Nobody's got a picture of it anywhere. No MIT, nobody. And uh, can I have the next one too? Thank you. Here's another concise piece of uh, field stuff. I would have a tendency to think that the center is what is radiating out for that particular field. But if you look real close, they're bonding together as a unit. You can't see the field here, but it's there. That field that this one is producing does not allow other fields and stuff to penetrate it. And that's why we have matter. If you have a frequency in a certain type of field, you have matter. Uh, okay, next one, please. This is uh, an artist, or com com sorry, computer enhanced picture of gold. And the, it's in one of the tra transition elements and they've already covered a lot of the uh, stuff, so I'll just kind of gloss over it. And I know from looking at this and looking at the periodic charts, next one please, and this is platinum, and you can see how dense that is, and next one please. Okay, here's your periodic table. If you look real close, where the uh, iron, copper, nickel, and cobalt, they're all in the same area, and they can all be magnetic, but none of the other ones can. They all have a magnetic field. And um, when you look at these charts and get into your transition elements, they can mix with just about anything else, but they also have another property, and that's what they call the high spin, or ORME. I, I prefer the high spin at the moment because that's what I've been researching. Um, your gold can go into this high spin very easily by changing the frequency. And then making sure that you maintain the right field, that gold will go into high spin in a heartbeat with all its good effects. Now, the basic gold in itself is reactive to sun and it's reactive to any other field and or a vortex. And that's the same thing with palladium and the rest of the uh, transitionals. For everything there, you have a high spin state. Uh, and gold among the ancients was called the living metal. And they had that for a reason. The living metal was just that. When you get enough gold, as in the ark, you got almost a life of its own. And that's been demonstrated throughout the Bible. And if you build something similar to the ark, you got a whale of a potential. But along these lines, you can build many other things like a copper jar coated in tar, or you can take uh, like that capacitor set up there. I use cobalt blue bottles and put rods in the center wrap the outside with aluminum foil and um, put them in a rose pattern like that. And man, they build up quite a charge. They're not something you want to be playing with in the middle of the dark. Um, but the, um, this mirror box I built just out of a whim and I've got a small stubble field coil in it, a real small one. And um, I put that in the sunlight, and it started right up to 40 volts, but it was very inconsistent. It wouldn't maintain it. It just went up and down like a yo-yo. But the other thing that I found from putting it on the oscilloscope was it was very chaotic. And that goes along with Mr. Tesla's patent 685957 and 958 where he said that you could take radiant energy from the air, but how he did that was he took and made a, uh, like a tube and put a polished zinc plate inside and ran a wire out the other end. And he said that if you did not use it immediately, it would blow the capacitor. 
Well, what the problem is with zinc is it's highly reactive as an electrical element, and that's been proven through science for ages. And that's what they put on the side of ships to keep the ships from getting electrolysis and getting holes in the hull. It'll take the zinc off first without harming the hull. So every once in a while, I gotta go back in the shipyard and change the zinc plates. Um, and I'm gonna change track here and go to ground wave energy. Could I have the next one, please? That's uh, what the proposed picture of an atom really looks like in today's thinking, it's the gold atom. But I don't know, I have serious questions about how that's laid out because basic, oh, Tamashi, okay. This is what I call a Tamashi chart. And you can look up Tamashi and find it. It's not very clear, but that's all right. And it gives you all the frequencies of those particular elements. Everything vibrates in its own frequency and its own field. And how you mix them is what you come up with, for better or for worse. Next one, please. Ah, the Vitruvian man. 1.6, golden mean. If you um, take this drawing and draw it out, you'll find out that every dimension of the human body is gauged around 1.6. Trees deal with the golden mean. That's how they grow their leaves. That's how they know how to petal, seed, everything. They know how to do the height. They know how to do the sap run up the bark, everything. That 1.6, the golden mean, is the is the root of life in a lot of ways. Next one, please. Ah, here's a good one. Okay, now when you get into ground effect, and lightning is one of the parts of the ground effect, you can tell which way the lightning is going. You can look at that one and see the streamers coming down off, shots off of it. That means it's coming down from the clouds. If you see a lightning bolt picture with the streamers going out, it's going up. Well, the thing is, 95% of them go up. Only about 5% of them come down. And when I was lucky enough to go cruise the internet, I found one real slow motion shot. I don't know how they ever got it on a lightning bolt. And what you saw was you saw the ground starting to glow. Then immediately, the glow went and contracted like that, and it went and contracted again. But what that tells me, and, I, and I've pretty much figured out, that around that lightning bolt, whether when it comes down, it vortexes down to the ground. When it goes up, it vortexes up, and that's what gives it its staggered padding, pattern. Now, when you have that staggered pattern, uh, it's supplying the energy where it needs to be. And this, to me, is pulsed DC, because when that slow motion film showed it, it looked like little, little balls. And, I, and from all the reports that I've read on lightning, like uh, the one classic that you can find on the internet was this lady was in a house and she could see right through her wall at the chaos going on outside and um, the lightning quit and the wall came back. But whatever was coming through that wall got caught in it. It wasn't being put there through a tornado or something. It's just that the wall wasn't there for temporarily. And um, when you have, um, well, that, that effect was pretty much covered with Mr. Carr's uh, speech, or Mr. Ring's speech earlier. Uh, when you get the right frequency of a vortex, it's going to do some mighty strange things that we don't understand at the moment. But I think we're getting closer because all the past ones that we've sat through here are, are kind of laying this all out. Now, this uh, ground effect, next one please. Okay. Well, my, my drawing isn't that great, but we'll see what we can do with it. 
Okay, right here you see um, Earth, which is negative. And right about there, above the Earth, is about an 18-inch layer where there's a constant field of motion. And when you lay down, say like on ground or something like this, you get revived because that is a healthy field to be in. It's neither positive nor negative, but it does help to transfer. Now, all your clouds normally are positive. And what this creates, a lot of this is caused by the sun's action in the atmosphere, <coughs> excuse me, to set up that differential. And when you have certain loadings on the earth, due to the clouds building up their charge, the earth is going to amplify it and then shoot it up to where it needs to go to neutralize it. Because whenever you have a potential, all electricity is, is a potential. You're going to try to get that potential from point A to point B through your circuit and neutralize it. That's all you're doing is neutralizing it. You're not dissipating it. You're not getting rid of it. You're just neutralizing it. That's all an electrical charge is. Whether it be battery or whatever, you're just trying to neutralize it. Next one, please. Ah, this shows the Earth's field. My printer's messing up, so, so you'll just have to bear with it. But um, you can see the field being forced back by the sun. And this came out of NASA, I believe. And what's happening here is the sun is actually forcing, the sun is back off over that way. And that's forcing everything that way. When this interaction occurs, this side of the planet over here on the left is being charged while the one on the right is being drained. Uh, but I've seen other pictures of this, and boy, I'll tell you what, it's quite interesting. Next one, please. There's a solar flare, and it shows you how much activity around the black spot there is. And a lot of those flares could be quite detrimental if we didn't have the field around the Earth. It'd be quite a change of pace. Next. Okay, the familiar concept of the magnet. Okay, this is a steel magnet with the iron filings up top. And what I want to point out here is if you look real close, you'll see a black spot right in the middle. I've got to be smarter than the pen here. Yo, there it is, right there. What you don't see here is, is another field that's going back into the center and, well, sort of like laying it out down here. This is what I did. When you lay this out, what you have is kind of divided up into four lobes. And each is a north-south, north-south. And when you have one coming up, you've got another one going down at the same time, which would fall within Mr. Leed Scalman's work. And he was quite correct on, on what he posed. Because when you get this magnetic energy flowing and flowing properly, which is what Mr. Stubblefield did on his coil, you will have power. And that's what, that's what we try to achieve when we get these things working. Next one, please. Ah, Coriolis effect. This shows how the Coriolis works upper and lower of the equator. Now, this not only affects the weather, it affects us too. And um, if you went down, say, like to Australia or something after living up here for quite a while, you would feel it. You'd, you'd notice the difference almost immediately as soon as you got down there. Next one, please. This is the weather pattern of the, I believe, the North Pole. Next one, please. Yep, and that's the one of the South Pole. Okay, next one, please. Now, I got this off the internet, and it was rather interesting when I first started on Mr. Stubblefield about three years ago. 
I found out something very interesting was that Mr. Tesla attended Mr. Stubblefield's presentation. And that was in 1902, I believe. Or, no, around 1878, that's what it says there. But he didn't get here until 1884. Huh, okay, well. Stubblefield coil. Okay, what we've got here is we've got an amplifier and you've got steel wire with copper wire around a steel rod or a bolt, whatever he could manage to drag up, he made it work. He was a very intelligent man for that period of time and he started out reading and studying everything he could get a hold of to uh, find out what was going on. And you can skip the last two on the uh, patent if you want. But this patent was very informative on explaining how to build it and what it was supposed to achieve, but with all patents, I don't care which patent they are, they leave things out of it, and I'm just beginning to figure out what that was. Next one, please. Okay, next one, can't read it. Ah, Mr. Leed Scallon's work is up on top. He was the one that built the coral castle down there in Florida. Nobody can figure out how he built it. Well, it's very easily how he built it. Uh, he used the frequency vibration, same as Mr. Keeley did, and it's the same way the uh, pyramids were built. What they did was they had a way to take a, a mass of substance and make it in a putty form and displace it and move it wherever they wanted to and then put it in place. And that's exactly how they built the pyramids. The size and weight would be irrelevant because they had the technology to dispense with the weight. And that's, what they, that's how they built a lot of these major structures in South America too. It was never done with slave labor. The accuracy is just too fine. Now get into this. When I got into Mr. Leed Scallon's work, I found that he was into generators and stuff, and he had a way to generate electricity just by using magnetism, and this was his design up top, and I took and made an alternator, about a 160 amp alternator, and rewound the thing, north-south, north-south, or, I'm a little nervous here, but we'll get it. Okay, my stator was wound all north. The rotor underneath here that travels through the stator is north-south, north-south, north-south. And what I did there was I had connected all of these stators, or, yeah, stators in, together, and they have to be fired through a spark plug because there's six magnetrons around a flywheel, and the flywheel is what supplies the operative power, just like E.V. Gray's motor. Could you re-mention how you say they handled the weights in building the pyramids? Oh, they took a certain amount of mass, the, the amount of mass that they wanted, and they excised it out of the cliff or whatever, and then when they excised it, they displaced it and, and turned it into a sort of a putty, moved it wherever they wanted to, and they just poured it in place. And what the cement was, was the oxidation of the material. And that's, and uh, if anybody has studied enough crystals and stuff, they know that the oxidation of that crystal is a lot harder than the regular material. Everybody follow that so far? Okay, well, we'll get to it. But getting back to this, but what I found here is that if I didn't put six spark plugs in there every time one of those coils fired, it would ruin the other coils because the electricity would go back through and destroy the Darlington amplifier in them. So we had to do something different. I, my friendly local neighborhood junkyard was real good about selling me the magnetrons off of lawnmowers. They thought I was crazy because I just needed the magnetrons off them. <laughs> Okay. Okay, next one, please. 
This is another picture of Mr. Leed Skalman's motor. And if you look at it, you'll see that you got the six pole rotor, north south. But you, what he did was he put the two north, two south, two north, two south, so on, all the way around it. But when you do that, you lose a little bit of efficiency the way the math comes out on it. If you put the stator into a north south, north south, north south, one's kicking and one's pulling. Uh, on each side of the rotor, so it's going to develop quite a bit of RPM. And depending on which way you turn, the plate will amplify the uh, timing to make it more feasible. Um, but I'm going to go into resonant energy for just a second here. Uh, with all this stuff that we're working on, we have energy all around us. It's a, we're enveloped in it. It's just a matter of learning how to utilize it and utilize everything that we can to keep from polluting the earth because we've got to do it. We just can't be held back anymore. The, this business, of, of, I've always had the concept of we've got to do away with money. My, it's not that money's so bad, it's just how it's used. It's destroying us, literally. And it's destroying the earth. And, and we just can't do this. And another thing about these patents is when you try to patent something, the first thing that happens in the patent office is it goes through the military review board. The military review board feels that it's national security. You lost it. Well, my contention there is that they ought to open up all the information that they have to all us people out here and work together to solve the daggone problems. It can't just be in one set of hands because it's going to take everybody to do it. But how to get the point across, it's another matter. Um, there's a lot of work to be done and I, I really can't say where to begin, but it's just taking a piece at a time and going for it. How much more time I got? How much time? No, how much time? How much time? Oh, okay. I can field some questions now. And I do have these handouts to hand out to people that want them. Um, T A M A S C H I I, I think. Say it again. Tamashi chart. Okay, there it is. T A M A S H I I. It's called a Tamashi frequency chart. I think they only got like about a volt or something off the electricity from it, which, so it did actually work in that regard, but they said that, you know, kind of, it wasn't any useful amount of electricity. Do you believe that they replicated, replicated it accurately and that the original Baghdad battery was designed just to produce about a volt of electricity? Or do you think that there's been something that's been overlooked and that it worked slightly differently? Because um, like I said, you, you said it's a shape power device and I don't think that they, touched on the shape of the vase being important. Well, the thing is with that, um, it, the shape is important to how things work or preserve. And when you have something like that, we don't know what they put in there either. And we're still finding out that they had a very advanced technology, which we're still trying to figure out. 
There's a lot of things that we just don't know about the Egyptian culture and the Baghdad area. Thanks. Uh, could you go into a little more detail about this box with the two wires coming out? Sure. That, that was just a whim that I put together. And what it is is, a, is six mirrors facing each other, and it reflects into itself. And if you remember the arc picture up there, um, the uh, box itself is like a collector. And when the sun hits it, whatever the force of the sun is that's coming through there uh, collects and hits that stubble field coil, and away it goes. But like I say, it's chaotic. I can't synchronize it. See, this is the coil. I've already broke one of these, so I've got to be careful. What um, explanation in terms of shape or anything else do you offer that explains how sodium, a combustible substance, and a poisonous gas, chlorine, combine to become the savor of the salt? Sodium chloride is salt? Yes. Yes. So what part does shape play to convert two dangerous uh, elements into something? It, it's not so much the shape, okay? It's what you're dealing with is two vibrations and two frequencies that have come together. And when they come together, they become a stable, healthful unit, okay? It's like this water. You've got two hydrogen and one of oxygen, right? It's good, but if you take the one, take the hydrogen, separate it from the oxygen, what have you got? You've got an oxidizer and a, a very inflammable fuel. It only takes about four or five percent to cause an explosive condition with hydrogen. Wow. The cube that you're looking for is 23.8 uh, inches. And this is derived from uh, the work by uh, Dr. Larry Babcock in uh, uh, Tucson, Arizona. Babcock did an extensive study on the various layers of thickness. He's a geologist. And the, the resonant frequency or the common wavelength between all of those layers that make up the Earth as it's growing is 23.8 uh, inches. Um, I had heard that Nathan Stubblefield had developed a system for sending, I guess, communications or perhaps power through the ground. No. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that and if it's at all related to Tesla's wireless transmission of power. Well, first off, he didn't send power through the ground, but he sent communications through the ground, which is different. And he had total clarity where Mr. Tesla did not. Now, Mr. Tesla, I don't think at any point ever tried to put power through the ground, but he did try to put it through the air. And his Colorado Springs uh, experiments laid out the groundwork for Wardenclyffe, which he wanted to build and couldn't because um, J.P. Morgan pulled the funding. Can you tell us about this coil over here? That is a stubble field coil that I built. It took me three days to build it. It's got 32 layers of bifilar wire. The steel wire is wrapped around the bolt. And the copper wire comes out as a primary. And I used Mr. Tesla's patent and double wound the copper wire on top. But without the ground rods in, boy, I mean to tell you, you can't do much with it. Um, oh, there is something I can show you. What is bifiler wire? Bifiler, it's two different kinds of wire wound together.
Well, I know what you're going to do. <laughs> this. made of wool. Because usually you can, and if it's in a snow field foil, you can take that and put it backwards up to there, and you can sign the foil. Anybody else has to be wool. I'm getting. I don't. This may. Uh, this may not be pure will. Oh well. Whoa. Didn't, didn't hurt. <laughs> don't want to break that. <laughs> somebody pass John a, a nitroglycerin tablet? No, no, I'm not ready for that yet. Okay, I, I. What I've done here is an answer to that coil. You see this section right here? Can you can you clearly see that section? This is from Mr. Bedini's um, work, and it, it involves putting two co uh, ground rods into the ground 40 feet apart. And I had that hooked up, and what I had was, was two sine waves that went across the oscilloscope, but inside those sine waves I had arcs, I mean definite arcs. And then every once in a while you'd see a couple of pyramids going across. And I have yet to find anybody to explain what's going on with that particular reading. And it definitely put out, oh, 10 volts, but man, it's chaotic. And I've been trying to get it stabilized. Okay, any other questions? Um, let's see. Uh, where'd Mike go? Oh. <coughs> I forgot I need that memory. I don't need the microphone. Well, here. This way it goes on the tape. Okay. I'd just like to respond to the question about bifidal winding. It's two identical strands of wire. If you if you wind 99 rounds or 10,000 rounds, you know that uh, the ratio is one to one. There, uh, you one could be a primary, one could be a secondary, but they're wound absolutely identical and you get a perfect ratio that way. And then you can take the two ends of and these two ends of the wire any way you want. But that's what by file, I mean, it's exactly the same size and length of wire. A different material. No, same material. Same material. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. So so you, can, you can make it different if you want. Yeah. I mean, the title, you can invent something new. They're connected at one end. Okay, John Arthur Taylor. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, we're going to take about an eight, seven to eight minutes.